I love our house so much, y'all. <laughs> you know, so I don't know if he said it because I had to run out um, when John got up. But in case he didn't, I want to tell you all, welcome to the glory spot. And y'all know I will say that every single time. And the reason why I say that every single time is because I know that this is a spot where God's glory resides. How many of you felt the glory this morning? That's why we call it the glory spot. I am excited to be speaking this morning. I really, really am because we have a word from the Lord. We have some good news. Y'all, don't y'all like good news? I do too. <laughs> But I want to take a second um, as before we go into this. Father, I thank you this morning for who you are. I thank you for your people. I thank you for us having the ability to gather here today to celebrate you, to fellowship, and amongst each other, Father God, and to lift your name up together, to lift your name on high. I thank you for the word. We just release heaven over it. We thank you for the people's hearts that are postured to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say this really quickly, if I can. I want to say thank you. Can we just give the worship team a round of applause? Because it's not always the easiest thing to do. It's easy to worship, but it's not always easy to lead all of the people into worship with us. And I appreciate the fact that we have a worship team who's dedicated to leading us into worship. They don't leave us behind. You know, you might have been some places where the worship team is all caught up in heaven and the people are standing around like, well, we're supposed to do where we're going. You left us. But no, they actively engage and lead us into worship. And one of the things that I really respect and honor about our house is that we don't have a system of hierarchy. So every one of our worship team members are anointed and gifted to lead in worship. So we don't believe in the A, B, A team, B team, C team, you play once a year team. Every one of the leaders that you see up here, they're anointed to do what they do. So we don't have a hierarchy. And so I'm grateful for that because we recognize and value and honor and steward the gifts that are in the house this morning. Amen. I just love that because what that tells us what that should tell you is that we're not a people of preference. So we are not going to love Sadie because she's in the front and just kind of barely wave and smile at you because you're in the back. We don't have a house of hierarchy. We are a family and we love well. So I want to say thank you to the worship team because sometimes we see unfamiliar faces. We might not have seen this person on the drums or this one on the guitar or whatever before, but trust and believe they are all anointed to do what they do. Amen. So worship team, I just want to honor you all this morning and tell you thank you for um, stewarding your gifts and operating in a place of generosity that you're willing to share that. And Sadie, thank you for leading so well this morning. You bless me. You have the voice of an angel. And when you sing, it releases angelic activities. And I always know when angels are present, because when your voice begins to go up and higher and higher and higher, it is because you're commanding the angels who are singing with you. And I saw the one standing behind you this morning as you were going up, and it was igniting something in the house that we get to carry out of here. So thank you so much for that. Amen. All right, so I got some good news for y'all this morning. Jesus has invited us to go somewhere. Right. Don't y'all love invitations? Okay, so one thing you all know about me. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at the clock because it's 1056 and I want to keep this to uh, a time. I'm not like Chris, so I may not be able to hit the 20 minute mark because unfortunately I like to talk to you all. And so, but um, I, if you know anything about me, you know, I, I love birthdays and I love to celebrate. So how many of you all know this about me? Okay. So for the people in the back that don't know this about me, I love birthdays so much that I literally celebrate my birthday every single day of the year. So my actual birthday is January 6th and I celebrate to January 5th. Who am I lying? <laughs> I get up in the morning, I look in the bed, in the mirror and I say happy birthday girl. And so and if you're in if you ever if you're in one of my groups every morning we have a birthday party um, just for everybody. And the reason I celebrate birthdays every day is because we often set apart time. We just wait like I don't I listen. Let me tell y'all a secret. I am 58. Oh, girl. What do you do? 
And so I recognize that there is a great probability, but maybe not, because I'm believing God for a long and enduring life, that there's more years behind me. So I don't necessarily have the luxury of time of waiting till next January to decide that I want to celebrate myself, because I understand that God is celebrating me every day, and he's throwing a party for me every day. How do I know this? Because in the word it says he loads us up daily with benefits. You know benefits are gifts. So if God is giving us gifts every day, that must mean that God sees me valuable every day. And so he, I'm worth celebrating. So if I don't celebrate myself, I'm wasting the gift that God has given me for the day. And I'm saying that because I want to encourage you all when you leave here to celebrate your birthday every single day. Every day that we wake up, every morning that we get to open our eyes, we have cause and reason to celebrate because the goodness of God has overtaken us and met us again. Amen. So Jesus has extended this amazing invitation to us. And we're going to be reading out of the book of Mark this morning, Mark chapter 4. And I'm not going to read it. I have my Bible here. And I have it here because I want you all to know that I do read the Bible. I actually have one. However... The print is a little bit smaller here, so it's easier for me to read it at home than up here. But just in case anybody would happen to believe for whatever strange reason that I don't read the Bible or preach out of the Bible, I just want to bring my Bible to prove to you we have evidence. Evidence. I mean, because sometimes it's not just evident enough for people that the word is inside of you and it comes out of your mouth. They need to see it. For so those that need to see... I got one. So we're going to be reading out of Mark. We're going to be coming out of Mark, our primary scripture this morning, Mark chapter 4. And I, God is so good. There are so many treasures locked up in the word of God that just blows my mind. I'm telling y'all, I just love God. I'm like, God, you got jokes. And which is good because I love to laugh. If you don't know that about me, that's one thing you will know is that I love to laugh. So I want to read um, Mark chapter Chapter 4. And I want to read this out of the NIV. Don't judge me, Lee. But I do have. I do have I do have our favorite here, the New American Standard, 1995. I have it right here. But I just want to read this out of the NIV for a second. Okay, so bear with me because it's a little bit long. And so, but I want you to have a spirit to hear. Everybody open up your hands. Okay, because you know when you're about to get something, don't you open your hands to receive it? Okay, so Jesus is giving us a gift. There's an invitation. And like there's an so back to birthdays. Keep your hands open. The reason I like birthdays is because I like to give. I like gifts, but I really enjoy giving gifts more than I do receiving them. Although I do love to receive gifts, I enjoy giving it. Come to our house at Christmas. You'll see what I'm talking about. I go crazy. I love to give gifts. And so this morning we're holding our hands out because Jesus is giving us an invitation. And whenever I see an invitation from the father, I think he's taking me somewhere fun for my birthday. And so we're going to be going on a fun ride this morning. So Father, as our hands are stretched out, I want y'all to just say this with me. I receive the invitation. I posture my heart to receive the seed. I posture my heart to nurture it, to cultivate it, and allow it to grow. Father, I will bear fruit in due season. Thank you for the gift of this invitation. All right, so everybody in the room heard you say that. So now, guess what we're also going to do? Now you've given us the gift of holding you accountable to what you have received. Somebody said, I don't want this gift. <laughs> Too late. No trade bags. <laughs> Got you. So anyway, I'm going to read this out of Mark chapter four, right? And Jesus began to teach by the lake. Uh, strike that. Let's go back. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The word again implies that the, he had already did this before. So again, Jesus began to teach, which tells us that he had already been teaching. And he really had been teaching if you read chapter 3. So you got homework. I love to give homework. I'm a teacher um, in real life. So uh, get some homework, read chapter 3. So again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd gathered around him, was so large that he got into a boat and said, it, set in it out on the lake. First of all, Jesus, that you know what? Jesus is out of the box because I just think Jesus likes to have 
church at the beach. So in my mind, I was like thinking about hamburgers and hot dogs and maybe some surfboards. And he was on a boat, like a party yacht. I don't know, my, man, my mind gets carried away. But to, doesn't that sound like a birthday party at the beach? Okay, I, I'm not the only one that was thinking that. Okay, it's an invitation to the party, right? While all the people, he sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were doing, were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, listen. <laughs> Jesus talked like me. <laughs> if you know me for a while, that's one of my favorite words is Listen. Listen, a farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell alongside the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on, fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among, thorn, um, fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good ground. It came up, grew, and produced a crop. Some multiplying 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. And I want y'all to mark that, that particular passage in your Bible, right? Because I'm telling you, it's Jesus was saying something, and it's going to bear witness to where we're going. And so he taught this. He taught the people in parables, right? And so uh, in the, it, it, if you read further down, it's Jesus was talking to the disciples because they're like, well, you know, you're talking in all these riddles. You're talking. What is this evil? What are you talking about? Can we understand this? And he began to, uh, he did not say, first of all, it says he did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, his own disciples, he explained everything to them. He explained everything to his disciples. He did not speak to the rest of the people outside of parables, but he spoke to them. So now we get down to number 36, verse 36 of the same chapter. And here's where the invitation comes. First, Jesus set the stage for the party. He had the grill out there, probably the, the iPod or whatever musical devices we have now, our phones and speakers, and the grill was going, and the people were out having a good time, having church at the beach. And Jesus, with so many people that showed up because he was well-known, everybody accepted the invitation to come to the party. And he was in the boat and all of this, and everybody was there there. And now they've at the party. And then sometimes how many of you know there's an after party? I love a good after party. <laughs> I do. I love a good after party because some things happen at the after party that don't happen at the main party. Like if you stay at a wedding long enough, I have it on good report. You hang around long enough after all the cheap wine has been brought out and Jesus at the party, the good wine comes out. And then I just heard something the other day, y'all. My mind is trying to digest this. How many of you know about the story when Jesus turned the wine into the water into wine at the wedding? Okay, so that's phenomenal in and of itself. So I was in this class with a group of people, and somebody said something that literally, I, it just like, it's very rare that you can leave me speechless or, or shocked. I was shook because they said the question was then asked. So they posed the question to us, right? It's like, so what, when he said, scoop some out and take it to the master, was it, had the water already been turned into wine and what they carried was wine? Or was the water turned into wine based on their obedience and they scooped out water and by the time they walked in obedience and got to the master, it was then wine? And I just thought, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. But it invited me to like think like, because God works in so many, in, in, in just like the way that he wants to. So what that did was place a marker in my heart to say, God, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to obey you. Because I might be looking in a barrel now that looks like water. But if you're saying scoop some out, I'm not going to be in a position where I'm saying, why? It's just water. I'm going to scoop it out and trust you that by the time we get to where we're taking it, it has been conformed, transformed into wine. I love a good after party. 
something happens in the after party. So we do these amazing retreats that we do and we have these women come and there's always this pockets of time when everybody goes to bed that there's just like a few women downstairs and the Holy Spirit shows up and so everybody kind of is getting like the thing now like no I'm staying up all night because I don't want to miss when God moves. So if y'all like an after party, here we go. But we, we've at the after party, right? So we're at the 30th. We're at the 30th verse. Okay, here we go. Ready? We're at the 35th verse. So he says, that day when evening came, first it was an all day party. All day. Imagine that. It was an all day party. We got to try to get y'all out of here by 12 before y'all start complaining. <laughs> that's not y'all. That's the people in Texas. <laughs> so that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, everybody raise your hand and said, I'm, if you're a disciple, say I'm a disciple. So that meant he was talking to you too. He is talking to you too. So that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And that's going to be the title of the message this morning is let us go over to the other side. Let's go to the other side. Let's get to the other side. Y'all accepting the invitation? Y'all ready for the after party? Okay, good, because that's when it usually get a little bit rowdy, a little bit ruckusy. That's when the police start getting called by the neighbors because y'all know how to calm down. That's when the fire department starts showing up because people start reporting that the building's on fire and they get here and there's no flames. It's just people slayed out in the spirit on the floor. I mean, the fire God is present and everybody is drunk in the spirit and they're like, where's the fire? Everybody is reporting seeing flames. That's that's the kind of after party we're going to. And he's invited us to go. So let's go. Let's get our shoes on. We're about to do this, right? That's when the activity gets going. And so he says, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall, which is a storm, which is not a good thing if you're on a boat for a storm to roll up on you. That's just not always a good thing. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat. So for those that don't understand what that means, it means that it was a storm. The boat was rocking. It was waving. It was doing all the stuff that boats do in the middle of the sea and that they don't have the ability to control. And that meant the waves were coming over. They weren't just crashing against the boat. They were coming over into the boat. Water was coming into the boat. That is not necessarily a good thing. Sometimes. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. That means it was full. It was almost full, right? So Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. I had to look up what a stern was because I don't do boats, small boats like that, um, because I have a fear of God. And I believe the scripture that says we should not tempt the Lord our God. So if it's not a cruise ship, I'm just, I'm not really about that life. Um, so I was like, well, what is the stern? And it was like, okay, so that's the back of the boat. Do you know all my entire saved life, I'm talking about BBS, little girl, B-I-B-L-E, Bible school, where we pictured the story of Jesus in the boat. For some reason, I thought it was like a three-level boat and Jesus was down at the bottom sleeping. But when I looked it up and I looked at what a fishing boat would have looked like at that time, it wasn't multi-level. It wasn't upstairs. Down. It was just like a boat. And he was at the very back of it on a cushion, which is like a, a little mattress, a pillow laid out. I'm like, wait a minute. It's raining, the waves coming over the boat, how can you even possibly be comfortable? That just was like, I was, so I, I, I tried to practice to be Jesus, because that's what I like to do. So I got my little pillows, and I'm on my couch, like a little set tea, I'm trying to get comfortable, and then the dogs think that it's their, t so they're like, oh, we all get up here, and I'm trying to push the dogs off, like get down, I'm trying to adjust the, and I'm like, I can't get comfortable here, so I know I could not get comfortable in wet, rainy, so Jesus, what was really going on right there? He said, hang on, the party just got started, I'm going to show you. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, 
rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. <laughs> I'm going to read it to you on the message because this just cracked me up, right? <laughs> In the message, what it says is this. And Jesus was in the stern, head on his pillow, sleeping. They roused him saying, teacher, is it nothing to you that we're going down? Like, do you not care? Like, what is happening? And awake now, he told the wind to pipe down. And he said to the sea, quiet, settle down. Check this out. The wind ran out of breath. The wind ran out of breath, and the sea became smooth as glass. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And over here in the NASB 1995, you know, that our house, this is our house wine over here. So if you want to know what we sip from over at Encounter, this is it. The, it, the New American Standard 1995 is the house favorite. It's top of the line. It's top shelf. Some of y'all know what that means. <laughs> and it says, so here over here is it says, and there arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? In the message it says, uh, when he looks at them and the sea becomes smooth as glass, he said, why are you such cowards? Oh my gosh, that pierced my heart like Jesus, I was trying. And it says, don't you have any faith at all? They were in absolute awe, staggered. Who is this anyway? They ask, went and see at his beck and call? Like, what manner of man is this? In the NIV, it says, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the, bay and the waves obey him. And I think if I found that so funny because I realized we're a lot more like the disciples than we think we are. And we, we live these lives, like we mark our lives, like we want to have the, you know, the, 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 the voice and the, and the courage of Paul. And we want to have the fiery zeal of Peter. And we want to have like the knowledge to be able to break the things down like Luke, right? So we get all of those good aspects and the attributes of who they are. But then we get to this part and I realize, ooh, I'm a lot more like them than I thought. So I want to flip us back to the top where Jesus gave them something. Because remember I told you he only talked to them in parables. And so sometimes there is this part in here, let me just go find it for y'all, where as he's talking to them and he was asking them like, you don't, like, you don't get this? Like as he's telling to them and they're like, Jesus, what does this mean? And I can't find it because it's not as big as I would like it to be. And uh, he, so he spoke to them in parables, but there's one particular passage part in here where he's talking to them and said, if you don't get this, then what will you, how will you get anything? Because he's trying to break it down for them, right? You got to understand it. What I heard him say was that you got to hear me by the spirit. Here it is. Here it is. It's a lamp on a sword. It said 21. He said to them, he talks about bringing a lamp and he said, whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into open. If anyone has his ear, has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider, consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more and whoever does not have, even that will be taken from them. And he goes on to talk about this like if you don't get this part, then you won't get it at all. So it's things that Jesus is inviting us to understand. There's an invitation for us to get what he said. He said, I want to give you this. I want to give you some more. But if you don't get it, then you'll lose it because you don't get it. So I want you to see the invitation and how God does it, right? So he said, I need to make it plain. Jesus is the orchestrator of the illustrated sermon. 
Ask me how I know. <laughs> okay, we're going to go back up here. He talks about the seed and the sower, right? And he talks about how the seed fell in some thorny, some, what you know, the rocky ground and all of that. And then he breaks it down to them and he begins to explain to it here what this means. Here we go. Scroll on down, Dr. T, get it, get it. Then here we go. It's 13. Then Y'all don't mind if I lean and get comfortable, right? I'm at home. And I have shoes on. Y'all know normally I'm barefoot. Okay, then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? Mm. Another translation, he said, do you see how this story works? All my stories work this way. And he breaks it down to them. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away. The word that was sown in them, that immediately the enemy comes after seed that's sown, which is why I had you posture your heart to receive the seed that God wanted to sow in you. So if you posture your heart to receive it and we are committed to keeping it and to retaining it, we have nothing for the enemy to come and take away because it's in ground that is committed to receiving it to foster it and nurturing it. Do y'all see what I did there? Where you think I learned that illustrated sermon from? Jesus. Okay. Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time when trouble or persecution comes because of the word. They quickly fall away. How many of us have ever been in a position where we've gotten an amazing, like maybe you got an amazing prophetic word and you're just rejoicing and we're joint because it's the answer to what we need. It's the immediate solution. It's what we needed to hear God say. It might have come through the scripture. It might have come from someone sharing a word of knowledge or wisdom with you and we receive it. And then the next day, the very opposite of what that word says begins to happen and then we quickly begin to acquiesce to something called fear, anxiety, and panic, right? And then it goes on to say, and still others like seed sown among thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others like seeds sown on good ground hear the word, accept it, and produce a good crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 and at times uh, what was sown. The, all these alarms going off. Is that like a... Listen, won't he give us an illustrated sermon? Who but God will let the storm warning come I'm tell it ain't nothing like an after party <laughs> his timing is smooth right and so I want us to understand this because God has invited us encounter to go to the other side how many of was that thunder? Okay. How many of you believe that God is taking us somewhere as a body? How many of you know that there's an invitation? He said, come on, encounter. We're going to the other side. Jesus invited them to do what? Let's go to the other side. And so sometimes we get an invitation to go to the other side, and we get excited about going to the other side. And in our excitement, we don't realize that there might be an obstacle. There might be a storm brewing. There might be tumultuous things that may be coming along. Waves may come up. And when it happens we cannot be like these people that immediately lost the seed that was sown into them God gave us a mandate when he said let's go to the other side not only was it an invitation it was a mandate let's go to the other side and nothing that comes up can stop us from going to the other side. Now, I'm visual, so I can picture myself in the boat freaking out because I am a good swimming pool swimmer, but I do not fool around with swimming, swimming in the deep places of the ocean because I understand that water in the ocean cannot be controlled. It is outside of the realm of my ability to stop it. And when the boat starts to flood it, I'm with the disciples. And some of y'all heard me say this the other morning. I'm on that cloud nine where I'm like, listen, where's the mop? Where's the bucket? Peter, did you bring what? Like, I want to know what's going on. Where are the towels? Uh, is there a plug? Can we open it up? We got to get this water out of here. We got to fix it. 
this. Oh my God, we got the Messiah on the boat. We're going to kill him and have to tell God he died. And it's like, well, what is that? Fish? And I'm trying to figure out, is there sharks in the water? Are there barracudas? I don't even know what's in this sea down here. I don't even like fish like this. And I'm trying to fix the boat and trying to patch it and keep it from drowning. And the more water comes up. So now I'm, I'm, I'm busted in my mind at James. And I'm like, why did you bring us out here? Whose idea was this? And I don't understand. Like, what's going on? And God, you promised me this. And we're out here. And now we're. And sometimes we forget. Jesus is in the boat with us. Sometimes we forget we came out of his invitation. Sometimes we forget that it was him that said, let's go to the other side. And when we have to remember that it was him that extended the invitation. So if Jesus extended the invitation, I can guarantee you that the invitation was not to bring you out to the middle of the sea to destroy you. God had never at any point in time has orchestrated, planned out, or plotted out your demise. He has always been for your success, always and only. And I don't know what happens to us, but we get a word and we get a movement and then things begin to happen. The AC goes out and then the city of Henderson starts saying, well, you can't do this and you can't do this and all the crazy stuff. And I'm telling you right now that there's not a storm that the city can throw. There's not a heat wave that can knock an AC out. There's not one thing that can come up. There's not one wave that can come across the water that will stop the movement that encounter is we know who's in the boat with us and we stepped out at his invitation his invitation is his welcome his bidding his thing to say come I'm taking you someplace and when he invites you understand this according to Jeremiah 29 and 11 that it says, I know the thoughts that I have for you and their thoughts of peace, not evil, to prosper you, to not harm you, to give you a future and a hope. His plans for us is to bring us to an expected end. Encounter, I'm telling you, God has an expected end for us. And if he has an expected end for the house, that means he has an expected end for the occupants of the house. I'm telling you, stay in the boat because we're going to the other side. Something has happened. Now listen, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. When God begins to invite you to go to the other side that meant that we've done all that we can do on this side we've done all that we can do on this side I've taught you and again I've taught you and I worked this miracle and I've healed this person and you've witnessed this and you witnessed that but there's a greater glory on the other side that you haven't tapped into and we can't keep watching it from the shore we got to get in a boat to go to the other side because there's something greater on the other side so if we saw the goodness of the God on this side of the sea how much more will we see it on the other what's on the other side and I am nosy. I like to be in the spirit. I want to know where Jesus is taking us. What are we going to see? What are we going to do there? I'm like, if you tell me we're going to Disneyland, I want to pull up the map. And I want to see where the rides are. And let's see what the time is. And we have the app on the phone. And it's like, okay, if we get the passes, we can be here, here, here. Because we want to hit all the spots. And it's like, when we're going somewhere, I want to know all the fun attractions we want to go. Because I want to plan it out. Because I don't want to miss a thing. What if we get like that with God and we begin to say, God, wherever you're taking us, I'm in it. How can we plan it out? Let's map it out because I don't want to miss a thing because everywhere you've taken us, we've only seen your goodness and we've only seen your faithfulness. We've only seen the beauty of who you are revealed. So I don't want to miss a thing. I'm standing in this boat, hook, sink, swim, sink or swim. I'm staying in. But I know for a fact that we're not sinking because they didn't even have life rafts. If God had intended for your boat to sink, you would have been born with a life raft on your back. You were not. <laughs> we're going someplace with Jesus. We're going to the other side. And so we have a mandate to cross over to the other side. And we cannot forget that Jesus is on the boat with us. Because what happens when we forget Jesus is on the boat, and then we, we begin to try to figure out every little detail of our lives for ourselves. We have to figure out and try to come up with what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And I got to figure this out. And I got to do this. This is. And all of a sudden, something really weird has happened. We have slipped back to a place that God rescued and delivered us out of, 
which was being the Lord of our own lives. Because when we came into salvation, we've submitted our life to the, to, to the submission and the lordship of he, right? So the moment we get into that place in the boat and we feel like it's sinking and we're going to drown and we're not going to make it and we start trying to fix the boat and we start trying to build a raft out of nets, I don't know, but it was just like all of this and we forget who's with us. And so now we be trying to become the Lord of our own lives. And that's never a good thing when we try to Lord our own selves. Because the, everything that we try to do, we have to maintain. I'm telling you now, there's no place that God has invited you to go. There's no place that he's taken you. There's nothing that he's given you that it is not his intention to keep you there. It's not his intention to make provision for you there. And so what happens if he invites you to the other side, the provision for the other side is on the other side. But if you over here thinking you're going to drown and you're trying to make your own provision here, it is hard to make bricks out of hay and mud. Ask the children of Israel. That's why he had to bring them out, out from under a, a false godship, a harsh rulership to bring him under the covenant, to bring them under the covenant of the, his love so that they could know that he is faithful, that he's a provider, that he is a good and kind father, and he's a good, just God who never puts undue weights and, jer and, weights and yokes upon you. So we're going to the other side. When Jesus spoke to the storm, I'm thoroughly convinced of this. I am thoroughly convinced of this. He wasn't just speaking to the storm and the sea. When he began to say, peace, be still. When he began to say to the sea, calm down. I'm telling you, I personally believe he was also speaking to the storm that was inside of them. If you're in a place in your life where it feels like sometimes you're overwhelmed and the burdens and the cares of this life and you're trying to move forward in the promises and the place and posture in your heart to walk after the things that God has called you to walk in and it seems like everything that could be thrown at you is being thrown at you. He's speaking to you this morning and he's saying, peace, be still. Which means peace remain, peace yet be, peace abide in this place. And the moment that he did, I love what the message said, the wind <laughs> lost his breath. The wind, you know, the enemy is as a roaring lion going around as is. So he's just blowing hot wind. <laughs> he doesn't have any bite. So the moment the wind lost his breath, it lost his power. I also believe in that moment, the Lord, because Jesus never did anything and never said anything that he didn't see the Father do and he didn't hear the Father say. And he is the model and the example that we're called to follow. So if we saw him do it. That gave us, put us in a position that we too can do that. How do I know? Because he said greater works than this shall you do. Right? And so what he was conditioning them to do, because Jesus knew he wouldn't be with them always. So he couldn't leave them in a position that every time they had to go to another place and another side where we had to go from glory to glory and faith to faith. And so the authority that we've had here, because sometimes we want to linger here because we've had all the miracles here. We've had the fun things here. We've encountered God here. And we're afraid to go to the other side to glory to glory because it's fun here. It's easy here. And we get afraid because the last time we tried to step out, the storms came up. So we'll stay here. And God has said, I've never called you to live here. It's always an elevation to come higher. It's an invitation to come and experience a greater level of glory. There is a greater, Lord, greater level of glory, church, that we haven't even begun to tap into. We have experienced some things in this house. But I promise you, sometimes we've experienced his pinky and we think we've experienced his whole hand. And he said, I have a whole arm. I have a whole wrist. I have a whole rest of the body that I want to expose to you. But I need you to come on and let's go, uh oh, Jesus, to the other side. He's trying to get us to go to the other side. So we have a responsibility to get in the boat without fear and trepidation, knowing that we can trust the one who called you. 
How do I know we can trust the one who called us? How did you get here from now? From the time that you were born to the time that you got here today. How did you get here? You got here by his leading. Psalms, Psalms 139 and 5 said, you've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you've you uh, followed behind me to spare me from the pain of my past. You have laid your hand upon me. That's how we know we can trust him to go to the other side. Because I didn't know what the other side looked like when I was five, but I got to 10. I didn't know what the other side looked like when I was 20, but I got to 20. When I was 20, I didn't know what 30 looked like, but I got to the other side. When I was 40, I didn't know what 50 looked like, but let me tell you, it looked real good. <laughs> And I'm at the other side. And I'm 58 and I don't know what 60 looks like, but I believe it looked better than this. So we're going from glory to glory and faith to faith. And because he's led us this far, and every side we went on and every storm that we've endured, he's brought us through the storm because he had an expected end. And his expected end is for not for us to die in the middle of it. The way that we begin to die spiritually in the middle of the storm is when we get out of the boat thinking we can save ourselves. We can't get out of the boat. We got to go on to the other side because there's something on the other side. There's something on the other side. And so he's gone before us to prepare the way for us. Church, we're going somewhere. We have words over this body. And so if the word is over the body, what's over the, what's over the head is over the body. And so if there's words over the house, it's over you. There's words over our house that we will have successful billionaires and millionaires. We'll have successful authors. We'll have successful music makers. We'll have creatives in this house. Well, guess who's sitting in the pews? <laughs> it's you. It's you. So if it's over here, it's over you. So we got to go. Come on, pack your bags. It's time to leave. Pack your bags. It's, trying. it's time to go, right? And then here's the beautiful thing. When the storm rises up, the storm had a mission because everything has an assignment. We have an assignment. The storm's assignment was to try to stop them from getting to where God had called them to go because there was something waiting on the other side. What was so valuable on the other side? What's so valuable on the other side of what you're going through? What's so valuable on the other side of what you're facing? What's so valuable on the other side of this boat that God keeps saying, come on, you ain't seen nothing yet. We got to keep going. What's so worth seeing over there that a storm would try to rise up and keep you from seeing it? I'm nosy. So if you give me a gift and you say, don't open this to January 6th, it's for your birthday. My birthday is today. I want to see what's in this gift. I'm shaking the box and I'm rattling the bag because I want to know what is so good in this box that you're trying to keep me from seeing it until January because that's a long way to go and I don't have a lot of time and patience. I want to experience it all that you have for me to experience now because there's plenty of time between between now and January for you to get me something else. <laughs> Can we open it now? So I want to know. I want to know what are you trying to stop me from seeing? I oh, so this is an indicator. See, this is the thing. This is the thing. This is the thing. This is the thing. Y'all hear me by the spirit. When life starts to get a little bit tumultuous and it starts to get a little crazy and things started happening, ask yourself, what is this really trying to keep me from going? Where is this really trying to keep me from going? What is this really trying to keep me from seeing? What is this really trying to stop in my life that God has ordained for me to have? And you know what you'll find out? It usually don't have anything to do with you. <laughs> It normally doesn't have anything to do with you. It's not trying to stop you from seeing what's on the other side. It's trying to stop what's on the other side from encountering you. Because there is a man on the other side that needed the Lord. There was a man on the other side that needed the Lord. 
He was a demon possessed man and he needed deliverance. Do you hear me? There was a demon possessed man and I'm telling you because they met him on the other side. Listen, I'm going to tell you now that this man was waiting patiently and had been waiting all of the days of his life for Jesus to show up even though he didn't know Jesus was coming. How do I know this? Because the moment that the boat docked safely by the way on the other side, they got there. Not one person drowned. Not, they didn't have to send out a search and rescue. There's not one body in a barrel that's coming up out of Lake Mead. That's why I don't fool around with Lake Mead. I have an aversion since childhood because I understood that that's where people put bodies when the mob and all of that. So I've never wanted to swim in Lake Mead because I just the thought of all the dead bodies in there. And I have proven myself to be prophetic because they are coming up now. That's why I'm full like me. But anywho, from the moment that the boat docked, it landed, they said this man came running out to them and said, Jesus of Nazareth, what do you have to do with me? How, listen. How did he know Jesus was coming? He didn't, but what was inside of him knew Jesus was coming. And the very thing that was trying to get him, keep him bound was the very thing that led him to freedom. <laughs> hear me by the spirit the very thing that had him bound was the very thing that led him to the feet of Jesus and said it's not our time it's not what do we have to do with you and Jesus said what is your name and he said legion and he began to command them to come out of him now listen listen I'm gonna break your theology for a second if you give me about 30 seconds here because we have this whole concept right that the gospel was not preached to the Gentiles until Paul came and preached it let me tell you from the beginning to the end Genesis of Revelation there was always 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 a glimpse into heaven for Gentiles that we that they got to see because there was always hope for them too it was always hope for them too how do I know this because these people were Gentiles because immediately some people saw what happened and they ran they seen the man was free they want to know what happened the whole village ran out to Jesus and they was like you killed all our pigs you gotta go we can't that's our whole livelihood Jews didn't keep pigs they didn't eat pigs they didn't tend pigs so that meant they had to be Gentile and in that moment they got a foretaste of what was coming for them too they got a look at the Messiah that they might not even realize was coming for them What's on the other side? What's on the other side? And then guess what? <laughs> it wasn't their time yet. It wasn't their time yet. So they begin to beseech him. You ought to go. Get back in this little boat. We ain't having a welcome party. They're not like me. They don't like parties. They didn't accept the invitation. They was like, can you please leave, sir? <laughs> we need you to depart the region. And what happened was the man, you all can read it for yourself, the, it's chapter 5, the man went out to Jesus like, I want to go with you, and he didn't let him go, he had to stay, and he said, but tell the people what happened to you, that man went from a demon-possessed person to a prophetic evangelist, ah, come on now, <laughs> how do I know he's a prophetic evangelist, because the, the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy, so everywhere that he went, in the people, the people People were amazed and in awe. So in everywhere that he began to tell what this man had done, it was a prophecy of the Messiah that was coming to redeem and ransom the world. We have got to get to the other side so it might have seemed like a fruitless trip because Jesus, why we come over here? Just this one guy, like yeah, you've cast out demons before. What was so special about him? And they don't understand the process that God always stops for the one because that one was leading a whole evangelistic movement to a region because they all begin to hear of the goodness and the testimony of Jesus what is on the other side let's go to the other side and they got in a boat and came back and guess what happened when they came back they saw more miracles because then we see the feeding of the 5,000 that was something they hadn't seen before they got to see other people healed they got to see people raised from the dead because they went to the other side they got to see greater encounters and greater moments and greater intimacy with Jesus and they got to see what they were called and equipped to do on a greater measure because greater works is this that we've been called to do in the book of Matthew when it talks about the story, it says that there were two men. In the book of Mark, I don't know what happened. He left his cousin out of the story, but that don't have nothing to do with me. 
So Matthew had a different version. He said there were two men. And according to Matthew, it said they blocked the way. So they immediately came out to the boat and all their demon possessions and blocked the way. Listen, the thing that blocked the way then became the way. Because when they got cast out, what was blocking the presence of God from entering into that region began to be the one that lead the presence of God in. Because upon the minute of them getting delivered, they went out and told people. So the thing that's been blocking your way is now becoming the way for you to go and for Jesus to get in and have access into. I'm trying to tell y'all. This year, some of you all have been invited by God to step into some spaces. Lee, you can come on up. Or Vicki or whoever is on the keys. Come on up. We can... Um, We've been invited into some spaces. Lee, you understand this. You talked about it. You were invited to leave one position and invited to step into another one. And look what God is doing, the growth of what's happening. So sometimes it can get a little bit discouraging because we don't know how we got here. And Jesus, what are we going to do? Have mercy. Are we going to die out here in the storm? No, keep pressing to the other side, church. Keep pressing to the other side. Listen, our church is going somewhere. We're growing. Keep pressing. Keep praying. When you go home, remember it's it's never what you the press is never just about you. Do you know why the enemy doesn't want this the thing to be expanded and we keep running into these little minute roadblocks? Because what's on the other side? There's a kids, there's a nursery, there's the toddler room. Don't you understand those babies are the next Joshua's? Those are the next John the Baptist. They are the next leader. So we can keep them out of a space where we can cultivate and develop them. It seemingly looks like we can stop what's on the other side. But I'm telling you, we won't be stopped. There's nothing that you're facing right now that will stop you from getting to the other side and seeing the greater glory that God has for us. We're going to the other side. Let's go to the other side. Let's go to the other side. Brad, when you were leading worship this morning, when you were drumming, God began to speak to me about you. And he wanted me to reiterate this truth to you that you're valuable here. Your presence, you and Laney and your val, your family, you're valued here. God has you here for a season and I'm hoping it's for a lifetime. But you are so loved and you're valued here. And what you bring to our body is honorable and it's good. You never miss the mark. I'm telling you, you're important in this house. Continue to stay encouraged because God is doing something in you and he's doing something for you. And what he's doing won't just stay here, it's going to bleed out. The impact that it's having your obedience to be here is turning water into wine. So every time that you keep showing up, because you you when we go from glory to glory, and sometimes we step into one glory into another, and then it feels like, well, what happened to the glory? But I'm telling you, your obedience to keep stepping into the glory is causing your water to be turned into wine. Every step that you take and everywhere you go, and you and your family are about to eat the fruit of the harvest of the seeds that you planted. Because you made a decision to come to the other side. There's fruit on the other side. There's glory on the other side that we haven't tapped into. How many of you this morning can might say, if it's not you, it's okay. And if it's nobody, I'm grateful to God that it's not. It's for the people in Texas. How many of you over the last month or so have been facing some things that feel like everything God has called you into is kind of making you think like, God, what are we doing how are we going to get here? Like, are you still with me? You in the boat? If that's you, I want you to stand on your feet. And if it's not you, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, I thank you that you've called us to go to the other side. You've called us to go to the other side. And we may not see what that looks like. We're in the boat right now. It may look like the water is breaking over the boat, but we declare you're taking us someplace. We declare you won't let us drown. We declare you won't let us sink. We declare that we will remember you're on the other side. And I'm going to tell you all this key because Jesus was doing something. Remember, he only did what he saw the father do. Jesus wasn't bothered by the sun. He was asleep by the, by the storm. He was sleeping. So what he modeled for us is the storm that you can sleep through is the storm that you have an authority over. <laughs> so when the storm is trying to rob you of your peace, you have the authority to shush 
the storm because trust and believe it's about to run out of breath and you can rest. You don't have to get frantic. You don't have to get anxious. You don't have to start darting to and fro. Take the model that Jesus left for you and said you can rest in the middle of the storm. You can rest where you are. You can rest with Jesus. You can rest where you are because he's taking you to the other side. He's taking you to the other side. For some of you, your storm looks like your children. But I promise you, God is going to bring you to the other side because he needs to see you deliver. He needs you to see them free on the other side. If you stay here, you'll miss what he's doing for them across the sea because he's working on them across the sea while you're on the boat working. Look, Jesus knew he wasn't bothered. He wasn't stressed because he knew there was freedom for the man on the other side. So guess what? The thing that you're worried about, that you're concerned about, the word says, I will perfect that which concerns you. He is perfecting everything that concerns you in this moment. Amen. So Father, we just pray for those right now and we just release the peace of heaven. Would you all just point your hands toward them, please? And we just de declare as a house. Peace be still. Storms be quiet. Wind lose breath. And we remind you of who's in the boat with you. And if he's invited you to go to the other side, he's invited you to trust in him safely to get you there. Because there's greater on the other side. Amen. If the prayer team can come, I invite our prayer team to come. For those that would like prayer, we have our prayer team here. They will partner with you in prayer and in agreement. Y'all, we almost there. We almost to the other side. Just hang on. Keep going. Thank you, prayer team. So if anyone would like prayer, the prayer team can come. We just bless you all this morning. And I encourage you all to remember, let's go. Where are we going? We staying here for the after party? <laughs> it might get a little ruckusy. It might get a little rocky. But I promise you, if you stay on the boat, he'll bring you to the other side. Amen.